Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to our webinar tonight, um, presented by the Western New South Wales PHN. We're speaking about COPD and home oxygen therapy. Um, and I think that you can see at the top of your screens um, our three presenters, uh, Dr. Charles Prabhaka, and uh, he'll be joined during a during a Q and A session later on by Maria Davies and Ellen um, Patterson. Um, so before I go further, I want to start um, by acknowledging the people of the Wiradjuri Nation and the different nations on which we're our participants are each meeting tonight. I want to acknowledge that we work with the traditional lands of many Aboriginal clans and nations and pay respects to elders past, present, future and emerging and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, water and culture and ongoing contribution to help shape the life of the communities in which we all work, live and learn. We're committed to working in the spirit of partnership and collaboration with our region's Aboriginal communities and Aboriginal peoples to improve their health and their emotional and social well-being. And I warmly welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, Australians who are present with us tonight. So um, I just would like to draw everyone's attention to the control panel on the right side of our um, screens. And just to let everyone know that they're automatically on, on mute and there's no video. If you've got any questions, um, please feel free to put them into the chat box. And as they, as they come up um, at the appropriate time, I'll let um, our presenter Charles know that they're there. If anybody by chance is joining us by phone, um, we don't automatically have a record of um, your connection for this webinar. So just so that we've got you as a registered attendee, um, would you be able to email your full, na full name uh, to cpd at westernnewsofwalesphn.org.au? Okay, I might give you a little bit of um, background regarding Charles Prabhaka. He's one of our two local respiratory physicians based in Dubbo. He trained at RPA and at St George um, for respiratory medicine and then took two fellowships, the first in lung cancer at Chris O'Brien Lifehouse and the second in interventional respiratory medicine at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in WA. Thank you very much um, for agreeing to speak to us, Charles, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so today I'm going to talk about how corticos. Oh, sorry, I got to do my learning outcomes. So the first couple of things. I first I wanted to go through diagnosing COPD, how to initiate management of COPD, and particularly the role of inhaled corticosteroids, and perhaps more importantly, how to withdraw inhaled corticosteroids when they're not necessary, and then recognise when oxygen therapy is warranted, and perhaps again, more importantly, recognise when it's not warranted. Um, so. Here you go. So hopefully you can all see my screen. And uh, I'm just turning off my video camera so you don't all get distracted by my ugly face. Um, <clears throat> I've titled this one um, Demon or Angel because really I've got mixed feelings about the role of inhaled corticosteroids. So what is COPD? It's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And really, I thought the, letter, the, the, the words are pretty obvious. Chronic, it doesn't get better. That's really important because it's different to asthma. Obstructive, so you've got airflow limitation. And for the di correct diagnosis of COPD, you need to measure it on spirometry. The diagnosis cannot be made clinically, the COPD. It must be made spirometrically. Pulmonary, well, that's pretty obvious. And disease, well, that's also pretty obvious. How did and how could I go to start? Well, it seems to start before there was any evidence about their use. And as I started going back through all this, I realized that really medicine has changed a lot in terms of evidence-based medicine in the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years. It was really just a black art before, and you know, people died things and just kept on going, expert opinion. And now we do a lot of research before things get proven and used. I think it started because 
airways disease is airways disease. And how corticosteroid has transformed asthma from a lethal disease to a, a really well-managed disease. And so it must work for COPD. Steroids reduce inflammation, and we know that exacerbations you use steroids. So maybe taking a little bit of steroid every day and making sure you don't swallow it because we know steroids are bad if we swallow them because they're toxic. So maybe if we inhale them, they're better. And so I think that's how it all started. Now, this slide is very busy and, and very boring, but basically what I want you to notice is that, I shouldn't click too much, the neutrophil here is responsible for a lot of the disease. So the neutrophil comes out of the blood vessel, it goes into sits sitting around the lung, it attacks bacteria, which is a good thing, involved with the macrophages as well, but it also releases various neutrophils, elastases, and, and so forth, which causes lung damage. And then you get um, um, uh, increase in the number of goblet cells, more mucus productions, um, and then you get activation of various T cell complexes down here, uh, as well as a little bit of B cell activation as well. But the primary effector cell in COPD is the neutrophil. So this is when I was training at RPA, this is what we did. You came in, you got a new diagnosis of COPD, we gave you a script for Spiriva and we gave you a script for Serotide and we said, we'll see you in 12 months. And really that's all we did. We didn't think a lot and maybe there are other people that think a lot, but that's how I was taught. So before we go on, neutrophils, they promote, sorry, steroids and neutrophils. So steroids promote neutrophil maturation in bone marrow. They increase neutrophil motility, so that means they go around more and they're more likely to get into the lung. And you know that because when you give a dose of steroids and you measure the full blood count, you'll see a neutrophilia on the blood count. That's because of all these extra neutrophils being demarginated and floating around in the blood. Steroids reduce inflammation in T cells and B cells, but they don't inhibit neutrophil autoinflammation but they do do some anti-inflammatory in some other pathways. So it's kind of a, a mixed bag with reducing inflammation. They do make the neutrophils live for longer. Um, and in neutrophilic asthma, although I haven't seen this for COPD, glucocorticoids are thought to maybe make the disease worse. And we know that neutrophilic asthmas behave more like COPD when you treat them. And in fact, they do really well with Spiriva and azithromycin rather than increased inhaled corticosteroids. Um, and there may be some also evidence that um, neutrophils have a reduced response to inhaled glucocorticoids. So about five or six years ago, the, this was what the gold um, pattern looked like. You had group A, you started bronchodilator if they weren't too symptomatic. So A over here, the low MMRC score or CAT score, which means they weren't particularly breathless and how bad their airflow limitation was or their exacerbation uh, history was so zero one or greater than two, greater than or equal to two exacerbations, and then basically if they were a bit more breathless, you started a llama or a lava, and then if they were still breathless, you added a llama and a lava, and then group C, so that is um, over here, so exacerbations um, but low breathlessness, you go llama and then you go lava lava. And the reason that this is because as llamas are shown to reduce exacerbations, whereas llama larvas don't, the larvas, excuse me, don't reduce exacerbations. And the black arrow means it was an optional approach where you could go to changing from a llama, llama to a larva ICS. And then group D, um, llama larva, and then you might go up here, but if they didn't have corticosteroid didn't work, you might come back down here, which is an optional. You could swap this way, and you can think about macrolides over here or romaflublast if you um, if you can access it, which is not available in Australia. However, then Gold came up with a more new, newest, the newest treatment paradigm, the newest treatment, which is basically dividing into two treatable traits, traits which is the, the popular thing to say at the moment. Treatable traits, treatable traits, dyspnea and exacerbations. And the first thing is you start with a larva or a llama in both both arms, and then in the dyspnea arm you step up. And what I want you to notice here is there's no step up really to inhale corticosteroids. In fact, the arrows step away from ICS. So if you're already in a larva ICS, so serotide, Simbacort, Bostev, um, I can't think of any others, I'm sure there's more, Brio, 
then actually the, the, the guideline is actually to step away from this and go back to the lava lava approach. Um, think about switching devices. Maybe your patient can't trigger them. Um, maybe that particular drug just doesn't work very well for them. Um, look for other causes of dyspnea. And again, there was really no way you're going over to triple therapy for just dyspnea. And we've got, got some good slides about where triple therapy works. If you're an exacerbator, then you kind of went down llama or lava, and then you could go down either of these arms here, and I won't bother. Here's interesting. So they talked about eosinophilia, and that was based on some more data we'll go through called the, the wisdom subgroup analysis, where basically if you had low neutrophils, low eosinophils, there's not a lot of role for inhaled corticosteroids. And if you have some eosinophils, there's probably a role. Um, and again, then you can see the, the romoflurast or the azithromycin arms down the bottom. But again, you'll notice that really the guidance is to go away from the LABA ICS. There's this one over here, right? If it's not working, get out of that ICS. And there's a reason for that. And we'll go through that in a minute. <clears throat> what I want you to remember is exacerbations are bad. They're associated with a decline, permanent decline in lung function. And there is a long time to recover from an exacerbation, about four to eight weeks on average. So here you've got days after exacerbation, you've got viral exacerbations and you've got bacterial exacerbations, sorry, non-viral exacerbations up here in the square. And you can see that 50% of exacerbations have resolved for the viral ones by about 15 days. But by 20 days, you still only have 80% of people have resolved. And at one month, you still only about 90% of people are feeling back to their, their normal baseline. And it takes a long time, on average, four to six weeks, to fully recover. Um, in asthmatic patients, we know that even after you see normalization of FEV1 and FVC, the, if you measure their VQ inequalities using research techniques, it takes a further six weeks for the VQ inequalities to resolve. So patients will still be, asthmatic patients will still be breathless even after the airways have recovered because the V's and Q's haven't matched. That is ventilation and perfusion, if you don't remember respiratory physiology and exacerbations that are associated with death. So that's when, you know, group one and group two COPD patients, uh, sorry, uh, are most likely to die from uh, cardiac events, but groups three and four are most likely to die from exacerbations and pneumonias. So we wanna reduce the exacerbations. So wisdom study, and I didn't realize this at the time, it was a really controversial study. Um, and what they did was they randomized people to withdraw, they randomized everyone onto fluticasone, when they didn't randomize, they changed everyone's inhalers over to fluticasone uh, and quite a high dose, 500 micrograms twice daily. And they looked at patients who had one exacerbation in the last 12 months. So these were exacerbated patients and they randomized it to either continuation of inhaled corticosteroids or withdrawal over a six week period. And people were worried because they were terrified that all these people were gonna exacerbate and they were all gonna have all these deaths on their hands. And in fact, what they showed, and you can see here, the, the rate of um, moderate exacerbate, moderate severe COPD exacerbations, there was no difference. You can see the curves cross in a number of points. Yeah, sorry. Um, and this is basically the four graphs, or the three, these three graphs are exactly the same, measuring the same uh, thing in different ways. And then over this graph, they did demonstrate that there was a fall in the trough FEV1 over about a 12 month period, um, which was statistically and statistically significant, but is not clinically significant. So they had about a 40 mil fall in their FEV1, which is about two thirds of a sputum pot. So not significant in terms of actual FEV1, but it was statistically significant. So it does seem to be associated with a little bit, and how corticosteroids do seem to slow lung function decline a little bit. So <clears throat> what the wisdom trial showed that in how corticosteroids were widely used in COPD, when you withdrew them, there wasn't any change in the exacerbation rate, which seemed a bit confusing at the time, but we'll go through more. More badness about inhaled corticosteroids. So the PAIDFLOS study looked at um, dry powder inhalers and so not um, 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 puffers, metered dose inhalers, and they looked at simbicorticeratide, budesonide or fluticasone propionate. Um, and it's a Swedish set of Swedish patients, cohort match, blah, 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 a lot of patients, 5,400. And what they showed 
if you look over here, the pneumonia per patient, this blue arm is any pneumonia. And by nine years, there was at least um, one pneumonia per patient. And about 60% of patients required admission to hospital. Budesonide, interestingly, despite having this fairly clinically, what, what appears to be a significant line wasn't statistically significantly elevated from the baseline population. However, to me, it's pretty suspicious. So my rule of thumb is if you give someone in clopidogrel for 10 years, you will cause at least one episode of pneumonia. If what was interesting was they didn't show in the PASOS that there was not there was a difficulty with the dose relationship. Um, the fluticasone dose was on average 50% higher than budesonide. Um, and I've written this backwards, I apologise. So it was about 780 micrograms of fluticasone versus 568 micrograms of budesonide. So that's a really, these are big doses. These are very high doses of inhaled corticosteroids. Um, and they did show that moderate to severe COPD disease correlated with a higher frequency of pneumonia. So what did they show? Well, maybe all they showed was that COPD patients get pneumonia. So the ARCTIC trial looked at the same, this, this question. So they looked at patients with COPD, with or without asthma, so ACO patients, and they compared them to, um, that was within group analysis, and they compared them, sorry, I'm waving my hands, and they compared them against um, uh, match controls with obviously no COPD or asthma, and clearly weren't, be, weren't on inhaled corticosteroids, and they broke them down into either high or low dose budesonide um, equivalents. So they converted whatever fluticasone or fluticasone and beclomethasone, they can convert it to a budesonide equivalent on some lookup scale. And they, they said FEV1 was the 50%, so they were talking about moderate to severe, uh, severe patients. And so what did they show? So this is again a very busy graph. So what I want you to show is in the COPD group, inhaled corticosteroid use compared with no inhaled corticosteroid use. So no inhaled corticosteroid use is the baseline is one. Um, if they're on low dose inhaled corticosteroid, there's a statistically significant increase in the rate of uh, pneumonia. And high dose went up, but it didn't, the, the, the confidence intervals did overlap. Um, this is without asthma. With asthma, similar numbers. And compared to controls without um, COPD or asthma, the rate of pneumonia is, is much higher. But again, it's much higher with or without. So this is without steroids and this is with steroids. So you can see, yes, COPD patients do get pneumonia more often, and interesting, asthmatic patients seem to get it more often, but COPD patients on steroids get more um, pneumonia than COPD patients not on steroids. So the Arctic study did convert that confirmed that no, it's not just COPD patients that get pneumonia more often, although they do, it's if they're on steroids, they get even more pneumonia. And they noticed that it was particularly prevalent in low BMI, increased fragility patients, low eosinophil count, which is, goes back to what I was saying on that first slide, that eosinophils, um, but neutrophils drive COPD and eosinophils drive um, asthma, old age and higher dose inhaled corticosteroid. But that's not all. Steroids are still bad. So mycobacterium and COPD and inhaled corticosteroids, this was an observation study. And this, the reason why it's an observation study, it's really hard to do this study. You won't find enough patients with mycobacterium other than tuberculosis. So this is the mycobacterium avium complex, if you've got a patient with that. So the brother of TB, I call it. So they looked at 3,000 patients with MAC or one of the related ones and 12,000 without. And they demonstrated that fluticasone increased the risk of a positive mycobacterium in, um, culture, but budesonide didn't and there was no increased risk of tuberculosis. So if you're in an endemic area, which thankfully we're not, that's not something you have to worry about, but you are increasing the risk. And you can see here again, a dose response relationship. Low dose, we, um, we, we, there's no relationship, but moderate dose in health corticosteroid or high dose. So we're now increasing the risk of pneumonia and mycobacterium infections. And I was just chatting to, uh, Lucy Morgan, a bronchiectasis expert, talking to her about how we can treat these better and starting up some studies in Dubbo with her from Concord because we've got so much MAC out here. 
So in how corticosteroids, withdrawal doesn't increase the rate of exacerbation. Use increases the risk of pneumonia, particularly with fluticasone. And again, with fluticasone, the use increases the risk of non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. So really, is there any point in using inhaled corticosteroids? So a couple of years ago, these studies came out and they, the, the respiratory world doesn't get exciting very often, um, but we were a little bit excited about this. So there was, um, and I can never remember which company it is, which is probably a good thing, but basically they always have the TRI study. And the most recent one they ran was Trinity. Um, and basically what they looked at was they looked at, um, um, what's it called? Trimbo, the new drug that's just come out on the market, beclomethazone, metarol and glycopuronium versus teotrophium indicatorol and glycopuronium. Um, and so you can see the, the, the test drug and the comparator arm. And what was really exciting, while the, the, the individual studies weren't so useful, when you did a pooled analysis for morbidity and mortality, uh, sorry, for mortality, you can see there was a reduction in mortality, which was the first time this was shown that in, there was a drug that reduced mortality. So this was really exciting. Interestingly, it didn't reduce respiratory events. So in inhaled corticosteroids, modern inhaled corticosteroids. So this was a different formulation and a different device to than what was typically available did reduce the risk of mort, uh, mort, um, uh, a, a mort, uh, sorry, it did reduce the risk of mortality. Other ones, so this is Trilogy, uh, and they, again they did, which is nice because so many of the older studies were, were done poorly. If you look at Flame and Torch, they compared apples to oranges. They kept comparing Lama to la, Lama, Lava versus Lava, Lava ICS. And that's really dishonest because we know that Lamas are the cornerstone for management of, you know, uh, management of COPD and reduce the risk of exacerbation. So I don't think you can really compare suboptimal therapy to a new llama because it's, it's not a fair comparison, but here at least they compared within their own set of drugs. So Trilogy, Triple Therapy, Anora, Lama, Lava, and Brio, um, Lava, ICS. Uh, they took patients with severe COPD, that is with an FEV1 of less than 50%, and at least one exacerbation, which was moderate, oh, sorry, one severe exacerbation or two moderate exacerbations, right? So they were um, looking at patients who were frequent exacerbators with severe disease. And what was it? They had looked at the rate of moderate severe exacerbations. They had a bucket load of patients. And here is just um, a sample of a uh, scale for exacerbations. What, what they, not what these guys defined as an exacerbation, but what is defined generally as a mild, moderate, or severe exacerbation. So mild exacerbation, antibiotics, but no steroids, moderate steroids, and they did say parenteral, but you know we don't do that since the reduced data um, with or without an antibiotic. Severe, you've got hypoxemia and very severe type two respiratory failure. And there's various cutoffs for that. <clears throat> a lot of studies don't define what they call mild, moderate and severe. It's a lot of um, the investigator defined. And what they showed, um, which company is that? I can't remember, GSK perhaps. Um, so they showed that triple therapy trilogy was superior than either of their individual drugs in reducing the rate of exacerbation. So you can see here, there's a fall in exacerbation rate compared to um, humic Belantra, which was, uh, sorry, um, which was interesting actually, because their humic arm had a higher exacerbation rate than here. And in fact, there's some data to suggest that humic is maybe not the most um, potent of um, uh, llamas, um, but other studies show it's more potent than um, Spiriva, Teotropium, and it's a bit hard to work out because no drug company is going to compare their modern therapy to modern therapy. Um, what was interesting is if you, again, a really busy set of slides, these were all the adverse events, and, and basically there wasn't a lot, sorry, my computer just keeps on flipping slides, a lot of ad adverse events. But what I want you to look down here is the rate of pneumonia. So remember I said that in how corticosteroids increase rate of pneumonia. But here it doesn't seem to. So triple therapy, 8%. In um, 
double therapy with a inhaled corticosteroid, 7%, and this arm, 5%, but it wasn't statistically significant. However, <clears throat> if you look at the rate per thousand patient years, you can see that the rate was actually significantly lower in the non-inhaled corticosteroid arm. Um, so there probably is, in those patients that get pneumonia, inhaled corticosteroids seem to continue driving pneumonia with this particular drug. The other modern therapy, this Trimbo-1, which has just literally been on the launch on the market, I think about um, a week ago or two weeks ago, it came out officially. I've been giving a few samples out from the drug reps. And they looked at a smaller group of patients, 1,500 patients with severe to very severe COPD. And again, they, they looked at one moderate or one severe exacerbation, rather two moderates or one severe, <clears throat> similar out outcome. And again, they showed that there was a reduction in moderate severe exacerbations. When you could pull the analysis of moderate and severe, there was no reduction in moderate exacerbations and there was no reduction in severe exacerbations. But when you combine these two, you managed to get the blue curve down a little bit more so it reached statistical significance. There was no increase in pneumonia, but they didn't measure it in events per thousand patient years. So it may be there, but they haven't measured it. <clears throat> However, we know from the pathos data that budesonide seems to be okay. <coughs> and Trimbo has beclomethasone, so it's probably okay as well. But we haven't got that data out there, so we can only presume not known. So triple therapy, when gold is when triple therapy is used as per the gold guidelines, it provides a clear benefit in frequent or severe exacerbations. So frequent, two moderate or one severe per year. These both of these studies didn't define moderate or severe exacerbations as best I was able to find. Maybe they did, but I wasn't able to find it. Uh, triple therapy did increase the event rate of pneumonia. Um, and that is some patients in very poor English pneumonia multiple times. And there was a reduction within both in those studies in all cause mortality, but not in respiratory mortality. So you're less likely to die of whatever event, maybe being hit by a car, but you were still just as likely to die from your COPD. So I did say I'll talk about the eosinophils a little bit more. Um, wisdom trial seems a bit suspicious. So why didn't inhaled corticosteroids reduce COPD exacerbation frequency? So I think probably the drug companies were most upset by this. So they went and did a subgroup analysis and they noted that in those patients that had eosinophils in their blood, and that was used as a proxy for sputum eosinophilia, and there is a study that demonstrates that blood eosinophilia does correlate very well with sputum eosinophilia, um, that there was a signal for a benefit. In fact, there was not signal, there's clear benefit for some patients. So if you look here, if you've got some eosinophils no eosinoph low eosinophils and some eosinophils, there's no benefit in, um, there's no increase in exacerbation within how could it go withdrawal. If you have less than 300 eosinophils, then if you withdraw steroids, you do have a bit of an increased rate of exacerbations, about one and a half fold. If you have more eosinophils, then your risk of exacerbation goes up to 1.75 fold. And if you do this mutually exclusive group, you can see here that again, it's probably not the 150 to 300. It's probably not the 300 to 400 group, but it's probably the greater than 400 eosinophils. But based on this, um, this cutoff here, um, that's why um, if you go back, if you, when you're revising, if you go back to that gold slide, um, the cutoff is more than 300 eosinophils. Think about using inhaled corticosteroids. Now this is a, a pharmacology study. So if you're drinking glasses of wine and pretending you're paying attention to me, please have your glass of wine and have a big sip now. The reason why this probably works is that fluticasone, the reason why inhaled corticosteroids cause pneumonia is, is to do with the binding of the fluticasone to the steroid receptor and how long it dwells. So how potent is it against the steroid and how long it stays in the lung. Now fluticasone in, is more lipophilic than beclomethasone and beclomethasone Mechazone is more hydrophilic. So I think what that means is fluticasone can get through the cell membrane better and beclomethasone gets stuck in the mucus layer of the lung and it's difficult to get out of the lung. But once fluticasone is through the, the mucous membrane, it sticks to the cells much better. 
The prolonged retention leads to increased immunosuppression of the lung. We know that's what steroids do. And while um, whichever company it is that makes fluticasone furate, which is the Trilogy, Brio, and they've got the yellow puff, which I can't remember the name of, um, fluticasone furate um, air stuff is more potent. That's what they talk about. They talk about it also not causing increased risk of pneumonia, although they don't talk about the increased risk of rate of pneumonia. Um, the, um, it is more potently immunosuppressant than even the flicosinopropionates. We've just got flicosinopropionates 10 times has a receptor affinity to budesonide, uh, sorry, twice the receptor affinity to budesonide. And that's, you can see down here, methylprednisone, which is equivalent to prednisone, has got a quite a weak receptor um, affinity. I'm just up here, if you're really bored, this is the um, macrophage activation, grenocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. And you can see that fluticasone furate, um, how it uh, reduces the uh, macrophage activation. So what's the conclusion? In those patients with eosinophils, in corticosteroids steroids probably reduce exacerbation rate. Modern um, in corticosteroids, so that is the beclomethazone in Trimbo um, and Trilogy fluticasone furate does reduce in reduction in all cause mortality. And that's not true for any of the older style in corticosteroids. And they probably decrease dyspnea to some extent but they do increase rates of pneumonia. Is that a class effect or just fluticasone furate appropriate, or does it actually include fluticasone furate? It increases the risk of atypical mycobacterium infections, and they probably don't work if you don't need them. That is, if you're not having those exacerbations. So put down your glass of wine. Here's the, the, the take home message for inhaled corticosteroids. Don't use them if they're having lots of pneumonia. There's no bloody eosinophilia, or there's no history of mycobacterium infections. Consider their use if they're having one moderate exacerbation or they've got some eosinophils, although that's not PBS approved at the moment. It's only if they've got an FEV1 less than 50% or moderate exacerbation. And there's good support if they've got a couple of exacerbations or they've got eosinophils, and definitely if they've got a uh, history of ACO. And in fact, if they've got ACO, you should be treating the asthma component first and worrying about the COPD component second. So, excuse me, I'll have a quick look, drink. Um, and you can read my comic. All right. Um, so how did oxygen in COPD start? Well, you know, patients were hypoxic, so we should begin them oxygen. And while I criticise the 80s and 70s with their um, 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 study methodology, methodology the NOT study was quite small, 200 patients. So this was in COPD patients with hypoxia. And they stratified them into um, either with hypoxia with a PaO2 of less than 55 millimetres of mercury, less than or equal to, or less than 60 with signs of end organ dysfunction, so polycythemia or pulmonary hypertension. And they randomised them either to 12 or 24 hours of, of oxygen. And what they noticed while this was what the randomization was, so that in those patients were using more than 15 hours a day, um, there was a reduction in the mortality by about 50%. So at 12 months in the low oxygen usage arm, one in five patients had died, versus one in, uh, well, 12% had died, um, was one in eight. And in the 24 month group, it had gone from 40% down to 22% in the, the oxygen users. There was also a reduction in polycythemia and um, pulmonary vascular resistance. So their pulmonary hypertension in, improved. And that's probably how it works, is reduction in, in viscosity and reduction in pulmonary hypertension. So this was then uh, replicated in a second oxygen study, uh, which was even smaller than the, the NOT study. So I think that was American, the NOT study, and this one's um, British. So they had 87 patients of which only nine were, uh, were women, and they randomised them to no oxygen or greater than 15 hours of oxygen. This was done after, um, after not. Um, and they did demonstrate that patients felt better on oxygen, um, but they didn't quantify how it was. They just said, oh, a patient said they felt better. 
Um, there was no secondary analysis really. Uh, they didn't demonstrate any exacerbate, uh, rate any hospitalization or exacerbations. Um, and they didn't show that there was any real like FEV1 improvement or anything else useful. Um, here, however, you can see the this is uh, in the women and this is in, sorry, this is, uh, that was women and this is men. I cut it off at the bottom, I apologize. Um, but you can definitely see there's a reduction. This is the oxygen arm here and this is, sorry, this is the control arm here and this is the oxygen arm here. You can definitely see there's a, a reduction in, in mortality with the addition of oxygen in those who benefit from it, or those who require it. Um, so people then thought, well, if giving oxygen to hypoxic people is good, maybe we should give it to everybody. So in this particular study, they gave oxygen to patients who are a little bit hypoxic, so 56 to, to 65. So patients that would not normally qualify um, unless their PO2 was less than 60 and they had end organ dysfunction. They titrated the oxygen to a reasonably safe level, 65 millimetres of mercury, about 92%, and they said, use them. And they followed them up for seven years. So you can see seven years of data here. And you can see that there's absolutely no benefit in these patients. There was no mortality benefit. And I love this though. The author concluded, well, perhaps we didn't follow them for long enough. Maybe if we'd followed them for eight or nine or 10 years, there would be, um, we'd start seeing the curves, curves diverge. However, if you can see here, there's almost no patients left alive at uh, seven years. I don't know how many he thought he would have alive at 10 years. Um, so in, what about in moderate hypoxia? So this one is for the patients that come to me and say, oh, I don't, I don't use my oxygen all the time, but I have it at home and when I feel a bit breathless, I use it. I call this burst therapy. You know, I just stick it on my nose when I feel a bit breathless for today or tomorrow, or I've got out to the shed and I'm feeling a bit breathless. So they put it on here and use it. Um, and what they showed, sorry, I just clicked the wrong thing. What they showed was that there was no benefit here. So this is short burst therapy oxygen. There was no difference in terms of how patients, and in their mortality, um, uh, and there was no real change in their overall dyspnea. So when you measure their dyspnea, there was, there was, there was no advantage. In those not using short burst therapy, that is, those, this is a whole pile of those, like um, not an MRC and a whole pile of others. They did demonstrate those using long-term oxygen meta-analysis, there was a benefit. Um, what about harm? So the NET study, I described the NET study as this, uh, coming up with a new, new and unique ways to kill people. It's what the NET study did. It was a lung volume reduction study. And so they looked at patients with emphysema and they said, well, emphysema in lungs don't work very well, so we should cut it out. And what they did was they had double, double to a little bit over double the mortality in those surgical patients versus those who underwent best supportive care. But they also looked at the giving some oxygen to non-hypoxic patients. So that's patients with PAO2, PAO2 greater than 60. And what they showed is you can see that Actually, those patients on continuous oxygen therapy with normal oxygen saturation actually had increased risk of mortality compared to the non-oxygen arm. And that was really unexpected. However, these patients that received oxygen with those rather than needing it, those that felt more breathless. And we know that breathless patients have, in, this is this graph down here, so MMRC2, have increased rates of mortality compared to less breathless patients. So that's actually in, in COPD, it's the biggest predictor of mortality. It's a classic uh, physician's question. Um, who has the greatest mortality? It's not FEV1, but it's how breathless you feel. What about oxygen and exercise? You notice this lovely lady, she certainly doesn't look like she's got COPD and she's got a non-rebreather mask and it suspiciously looks underinflated. I don't think she's getting much benefit and needed it to begin with. So in this, the if you want to do any studies and you want to get a publication out there, do a, a rehab, a pulmonary rehab study. You only need about 20 patients to get published. You can even get away as low as 10 patients. You can do clever things like using patients as their own controls to double the number of patients. So this is what they did. They had 35, 35 patients and they were their own controls. So that is, they did the study with them 
and on all of them with oxygen and all of them without oxygen and repeated the process, which is a little bit dodgy, and I'm sure Ellen can talk about this more, but in pulmonary rehabilitation, there is certainly a learning. Patients learn how to do things and they go there to improve things. So you'd expect them to improve through the course of pulmonary rehab. And what they did is they randomized patients to breathe to breathe air for a fixed fraction of oxygen at 24% via a Douglas bag. Douglas bag is just like a giant one of these on their faces. So it was a really huge one to guarantee the amount of oxygen they're giving 24%. So they didn't titrate the oxygen to correct it. Um, most of these patients had normal oxygen at baseline, um, probably mid 90s rather than even low 90s, but they did desaturate on exertion, which suggests probably a little bit of pulmonary hypertension involved. They didn't demonstrate there was any change. So you can see here again, there's no, don't worry about which dot is which dot because I can't remember actually either. And it doesn't, oh, it's easy. The circle dot is, um, the filled in dot is the oxygen arm. Um, but there's no change in their dyspnea. The um, ABG pH falls at the same rate. Their stress hormones went up at the strain rate. The PAC, PACO2 response actually given oxygen, they've got a little bit of hypercapnia. And you can see there's uh, the little, uh, the statistical significance here with that. Maybe not important though. Their lactate response, which is a measure of their anaerobic threshold, which is a measure of how much they can exercise, didn't change either. So there was no improvement in their ability to exert themselves on oxygen. Um, and uh, all we showed was that we managed to improve their blood oxygen, but it still fell as they increased their workload. So pulmonary rehab oxygen, not fantastic at the moment. Um, this basically says the same thing, um, breathing compressed air or um, uh, this is the, so they had, did have an oxygen thing on the, uh, an air thing on their nose that so they were at least somewhat blinded. And you can see the dyspnea breakpoint was similar, the noradrenaline breakpoint, the, the stress hormones breakpoint is similar, and the lactate breakpoint break was similar as well. So there's no, no advantage given it. But what about patients if they were hypoxic when they exercise, like properly hypoxic. So these are patients that do set trend down to less than 80% on their six minute walk test. 27 patients, again, a huge study. Again, they were their own controls. And they gave them one to three litres of, of nasal prong oxygen trying to titrate for an FIO2 of 92%. Patients um, walked more steps, but didn't walk more distance. Now this is, I don't understand this one. And I meant to ask Ellen, but I forgot to ask her. Um, so they walked about 15 more steps in the uh, five minute walk test rather than a six minute walk test. There was no statistically change in dyspnea uh, and the CRQ is one way of measuring dyspnea and the SGRQ is a different way and there are different domains in there. There's like um, emotional domains and quality of life domain. And I can't remember what the letters uh, stand for. But you can see here the point falling was all less than one point. Um, the minimally important clinical difference for a Borg, which is the big scale we tend to use, one to 10, is 1.4, SGRQ is four, and you can see we're not nowhere even near four, or one point on the individual scales. And you know, the only one we got close to is over here in this single domain. You can see that the number of steps statistically could increase, but they're just on the Borg scale. While statistically decreased, it was not clinically important difference. So they didn't, they were less dyspneic and it did fall, but it wasn't big enough to be, for them to feel the difference. So they did it again. This is a bigger study. Um, they enrolled 55 patients, they only analyzed 47. Uh, this is the other good thing about doing uh, physiotherapy studies. You don't have to do good, good uh, statistics either. So they did um, per protocol analysis, as they had a 15% dropout rate rather than an intention to treat analysis. And they did an incremental shuttle walk test. And again, Ellen can explain that better, but it's it's a way of measuring uh, exertion at a constant workload. So how long you can exert yourself at a fixed workload. These guys, I like this a little bit better. So they titrated the oxygen better and they were clear about how they did it. They titrated to keep the SATs above 90%. About half the patients required two litres, but half the patient required four to six litres to keep their oxygen up when they exerted themselves. Again, there was no change in the overall dyspnea, but there was in this group a change, a, 
they did reach the minimally important, minimally, minimally clinically important difference in fatigue, emotion and mastery scores. Um, and you can see that uh, down here. So they, um, in the room air group, they managed to go up by about 300 seconds compared to the oxygen group. The, sorry, the oxygen group managed to go up compared to the room air group by about 300 seconds. Their distance went up a fair amount um, and their, um, uh, oh, that was the mean change of the above. What I want you to note though is that even in the pulmonary rehab group, there was still an improvement of 400 meters in their ex uh, uh, exercise on the um, um, the shuttle walk test. So the pulmonary rehab is probably the biggest thing here. Sorry, the difference is not 489. Uh, the, yeah, sorry, the difference is 400. The, the pulmonary rehab is probably the best thing here. The pulmonary rehab definitely improves things, but while they were on oxygen, there was definitely a significant improvement in their ability to exert themselves for longer and for further. So oxygen reduces mortality in those that qualify. That is if you're hypoxic or you're hypoxic, less hypoxic, but still hypoxic, but with right heart failure or polycythemia. You have to use it 16 hours per day. The main benefit is mortality. There's some improvement in, in, in feeling less breathless. First oxygenation therapy, that is using it just when you need it, does not work. It does not improve mortality and it doesn't really improve dyspnea. There's a a psychological component, but no real true improvement. The rehab results are mixed, but overall, I suspect there's an, an improvement in, um, in exertion while at pulmonary rehab. Whether that translates in longer term when they leave pulmonary rehab after they've completed the program is another question. And I haven't managed to find a study that shows that those that were given oxygen during pulmonary rehab that translates into better long-term outcomes. In those patients that um, on a six minute walk test have a 10% improvement in with their exertion, um, uh, Enable will fund them to get oxygen at home as well. Um, so what I want you to do is I'm gonna put a challenge to you for this week. So again, put down your glasses of wine, get your pens out, if you use pen still, write on your computer otherwise, type on your computer otherwise, before you start an inhaler this week, I want you to make sure you confirm they've got the correct diagnosis. Use spirometry pre and post. If you're lucky enough and you're in Dubbo, send them along to our lab. Um, I will report it, Henry will report it. They'll tell you what to do and what the diagnosis is on the basis of that spirometry. All right, we are very happy to do that. Um, I want you to review five patients this week for their, their COPD medication. Make sure they can use their puffer. Are they capable of triggering their device? That is a problem with a lot of patients. They can't inhale hard enough. If you're not sure, send them up to the hospital. We are more than happy to review them in our clinic. Just give us a call at the hospital and we can book them in. Very easy, can them call them amateur care. If they're on a puffer, they must be using a spacer. Have you checked they can use a spacer properly? Make sure they're on appropriate prescriptions. If they've got a diagnosis of COPD, make sure they're on a llama. That is the first priority in the management of COPD because llamas reduce exacerbations for all comers in COPD, whereas inhaled corticosteroids just reduce them in those who have um, moderate exacerbations in, sorry, moderate exacerbations in severe disease. It's not proven otherwise. Are they on inhaled corticosteroid? Have they been on triple therapy because they saw me at RPA 10 years ago and they got the purple puffer and the, the, the gray puffer with the green button? If they're on triple therapy, have a look at their exacerbation rate. Are they exacerbating? If they're not exacerbating, why did you pull off their inhaled corticosteroids and see if they stop exacerbating? If they've had a recent, if they've had a pneumonia, make sure they're on a low potency inhaled corticosteroids. If they're on high potency inhaled corticosteroids, can they be swapped to lower potency steroids? Or even better, can they be swapped to triple therapy, Trilogy or Trimbo? Make sure you referred all patients to COPD and any other lung disease we're happy to see to pulmonary rehab. And then consider who might need home oxygen and refer them on to us at the hospital for further evaluation. All right, so I've finished. Are there any questions um, you'd like to ask? Charles, we haven't seen any questions um, in our question box, but just a, a good opportunity for anyone who's listening now who might need clarification of anything. Um, put it in the question box for Charles. Um, 
Charles, uh, I was just wondering whether you and Maria and Ellen are, are you moving on to discuss a case now? I hadn't, um, no, unfortunately, no, I didn't do a case. I forgot to do that until about two hours ago when I remembered what you'd asked me to do. So I'm sorry, but I can make one up if you like. Oh, you're very welcome to make one up. <laughs> have I got a spirometry? Let's have a look. Hmm. Mm. I was Think just thinking, I, oh sorry Charles, I'd visited Maria a year or two ago over in the rehab clinic and found that extremely interesting and I don't know whether there might be a case of a person, you know, a, a typical person who might go through pulmonary rehab and 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 what, what um, <laughs> I can, I can give you an example. So I had a, I've got a, a lovely lady. She's got um, bronchiectasis. Um, she's actually got MAC as well. She lives over in uh, over near the the bowling club on the big hill as you go down over, towards Oberly Road to the zoo. Uh, so she lives down that way, um, Delroy Parkway. I can't quite remember. Um, and she was quite breathless. She could only walk about. 50 or so metres. So she came to the pulmonary rehab and she took on what was said there and continued implementing that. She came to see me in clinic, uh, let's say six months later, and what she was doing was where she could only walk a couple of hundred metres on the flat prior to pulmonary rehab, she was now doing daily exercise where she pushed herself to walk up the hill um, outside, the, outside the, the bowling club. And she was doing that twice a day as part of her exercise. And she wasn't stopping and she wasn't getting breathless. And she'd done what she'd learned in pulmonary rehab. She had had graded herself. So she started just walking up at a very slow speed at 80% of her workload. So she didn't have to stop for breathlessness and getting to the top. And she was slowly pushing herself faster and faster. And she was doing really, really well just from implementing the pulmonary rehab um, aspect. Helen, you got any example patients? Fantastic. I've just got a couple of questions here, um, Charles. I might mm -hmm. put them to you. Um, we've got a one question from one of our local pharmacists um, asking about portable um, oxygen. And I, I think it's probably in reference to the number of hours of oxygen that are required before people have benefit. Um, our questioner says, does this mean that portable oxygen is of little use? So I give it to patients who are profoundly hypoxic. If you're borderline hypoxic through the day, I just ask you to use it for 16 hours a day. If there is an improvement, um, and Maria knows the numbers better than me, in the six minute walk test, um, then there is a role for portable oxygen. However, the studies are a pretty mixed bag with portable oxygen. Um, and I didn't go through them all because they all just, they either report no improvement or some improvement. They're very poorly uh, powered. I base what I do off the enable guidelines. If the patient is struggling to use oxygen to get to the 16 hours a day at home, um, then there is a role for adding in portable oxygen. Maria, what are the, the current, what do you have to do for a portable oxygen assessment? You're still muted, Maria. We do two six minute walk tests, one without oxygen and another one with oxygen. And the new guidelines show a 50, you have to have a 50% improvement in the distance that you cover. So There's a um, huge, huge requirement to get 50% improvement for benefit. And I think that's because there is very little evidence for um, the improvements in pulmonary rehab. Thanks. Now I've got another question on um, oxygen. It's just how often are people followed up uh, after they return home on oxygen? So we in hospital, when we start it, we, we start it on short-term oxygen therapy. And in practice, we're supposed to see patients within I think it's eight weeks. Uh, obviously, we're struggling a little bit at the moment to, to get that in. 
Um, and then once we do that, we reassess them to make sure it wasn't just because they're recovering from that, that exacerbation. And that goes back to the, one of those first slides I showed where there was um, the two curves of viral and non-viral ex exacerbation recoveries. And it took about four to six to eight weeks to recover after an exacerbation. Um, so we evaluate them at that later date and they still require oxygen and we'll put a long-term ap um, application in and they need to have an ABG um, to prove that they've got that threshold that we talked about, 59 or uh, 55, um, with or without um, uh, polycythemia or pulmonary hypertension. And then if, we, if they qualify, we'll put it in a long-term oxygen application and that's reviewed yearly. Um, Maria does some of that, but most of that is managed by my other clinic nurse, Ange. So she has a book where she keeps track of them and make sure they're booked in for yearly reviews to ensure that they still require oxygen. Thanks, Charles. I've got a number of questions here. Some of them can probably be pretty short. Um, do nebulizers have a role anymore? I don't believe so. I think my favourite thing of being in the hospital was with, with well, I shouldn't say that blanket statement. Uh, I don't think nebulized subunimal opatropium has a role anymore. Um, there are a couple of, there are a number of studies out there that show that metadose inhalers with a spacer deliver the same amount of drug to the lungs that a five milligram nebulizer does. So uh, six, depending on the study, either six to 12 pass somewhere in that vicinity gives you five milligrams of nebulized subunimal to the lungs. Um, so that's about 600 to 1200 micrograms inhaled. Um, there are other studies that show there's increased um, morbidity with the use of nebulizers when we're not talking about droplets. And in fact, they, they did a study where they looked at nebulizers use in emergency and there was a direct correlation between serum salbutamol level measured and risk of major ca adverse cardiac event approaching about 2% for high levels. And I can't remember what the, quite the cutoff was, but that does demonstrate that there is toxicity. Similar to the epitropium, you know, if they're on a llama, there's no real role for adding in extra antimuscarinic. So I would never give somebody who's on a llama atrovent or um, nebulized epitropium and an um, MDI atrovent or nebulized at, um, atrovent. Uh, similarly in the hospital, I, I very rarely use nebu um, atrovent at all. I just leave them on their llama. Uh, I think that's quite effective as long as they can get in the lung. I think more of the time we spend doing puffer technique and making sure that patients can trigger the devices and we swap more devices and change more puffers, not because of inappropriate prescribing, but because the patients can't use their devices. They've either got crumbly arthritic hands and they can't twist this one or put the capsule in that one or push this button, or they've got insufficient inspiratory flow. And I see that all the time, um, or they can't coordinate their breath hold. So the soft mist device, what they call um, teotropium recipe mat, and they just see that you ask them, do you see the smoke come out? Oh yeah, every time I use it, well they'll tell me, I don't think it's working because today I didn't see the smoke come out of it. It's like once in a, in a blue moon, they actually get the drug in their lung. It's, yeah. it's absolutely shocking. Um, I've seen patients spray it in the air, literally, like I, it's like a story that you tell and everyone's like, oh, whatever. But I've seen patients, oh, this is how I use it, like perfume. Um, yeah. It's, it's just Got crazy. Another couple of questions, Charles, and, and this one follows on. Do you have a preferred inhaler device? Um, I like, I use a lot of Elliptus series device because I think it's a really simple device to use and it's same device as you step up. You start in cruise and you go to a Noro and then you go to, to Trilogy. So I, I like it from that perspective. I'm a little bit I hope there's no drug reps listening in on this, but I get a little bit narky. I think the drugs company promoted their drug a little bit dishonestly going on the media, but Trimbo did the same thing, so I shouldn't complain too loudly. Um, going on the media and saying, this is a new drug, it's gonna transform COPD. And for about six months, I had to keep on telling patients why they didn't qualify for their puffer uh, that when they want a trilogy. But I like the Elliptus series, but often what I do is I, I just tell my nurse, um, Ange in the clinic, I say, uh, I wanna start a llama. And she assesses the patient and tells me what script to write because she's worked out which puffer they can use properly. The only yep. time I have a particular preference is, is confused people, um, prostatic men and glaucoma patients, oh, and cardiac patients, um, particularly rhythm control patients. Um, I will tend to try and use a clidium, um, which is Brimica and Brataris, 
because that drug has a very short plasma half-life um, and so it has less cardiac toxicity. So when I was talking about toxicity from salbutamol nebulizers, there's also another study that shows that there'll be a, a major adverse cardiac event um, for about 2% of patients when you first introduce a llama. And that might be as low as just a simple troponin leak um, all the way up to uh, a, a cardiac, like a proper uh, acute cardiac in, um, event, like a non-STEMI or STEMI. Okay, that's uh, it's good to know, know that. I, I was certainly totally under, unaware. We're actually a bit over time, but there's a good question here, Charles. It's um, who should be referred uh, for pulmonary rehab? Oh, Ellen, who's that? Um, so, great question. Pulmonary rehab, any respiratory patient. So, our pulmonary rehabilitation programs, we have two separate programs. Um, our first program is probably more of sort of, we call it more of a sort of an able body program. Um, they're working more to that moderate intensity in terms of their exercise tolerance. Um, again, it's not just the exercise component, they're also taught techniques to manage their um, breathlessness and also education. So they then can continue to manage their chronic airway disease past the respiratory and pulmonary rehab program. We also then have more of an end stage program. So they may, may be any of our um, COPD or oxygen dependent patients. It's more of that chair based program, slower pace, but they're still getting the gains by strengthening a bit of cardiovascular endurance. And then also all of those controlled breathing techniques to help manage their breathlessness. So any patients with respiratory conditions, um, Myself, Maria and Kerry, our uh, nurse in our clinic, more than happy to take the referrals and assess the patients for suitability. They just have to be able to, you know, understand any, any verbal cues and be able to get to the program to attend. They don't have to be particularly mobile. We've got patients who can sit around, patients that come in wheelchairs, patients that come in scooters. They, the girls work out some studies. If I can have 10 seconds to push pulmonary rehab, the studies show that pulmonary rehab is at least as good as inhalers in reducing exacerbation of frequency and quality of life and in some measures twice as good. You cannot do better than by referring patients to pulmonary rehab. Much better than inhalers or at least as good as inhalers but in some cases better. That, that is a very important message. Um, that, that is uh, really, really good to know. Um, can I just ask, Charles, we've just spoken about referral to pulmonary rehab. Um, what about referral for um, spirometry and the respiratory clinic? Are there any quick messages you want to give to the GPs? We are more, so referrals to respiratory clinic is a, a real problem. Our waiting list is, is nine months, blowing up to 12 months at the moment. Uh, there was a bit of a perception with Henry's beginning that we are having extra capacity, but of course that was to replace Sagami, who unfortunately resigned. Yeah. Um, and we're not quite sure if we're going to be able to keep on accepting referrals at this point in time. We're really struggling um, yeah. to get through the current backlog of patients. But our spirometry lab, our lung function lab, has plenty of room. Um, we are now offering um, spirometry, uh, full lung function testing, uh, asthma provocation studies. We've got a new machine called Pheno, which is really good for... Um, managing complex, uh, not complex asthma, but stepping down in how corticosteroids, you know how much I hate those, in asthmatic patients. Um, we're also doing cardiopulmonary exercise testing. So if you want to get this patient referred, you can just flick us a letter, say, yep. um, thank you for seeing this patient um, for spirometry, for lung function testing. Uh, we suspect, and if you tell us what you suspect the diagnosis is, we'll even order the right set of testing for you. If you say, uh, I'd like to confirm the diagnosis of COPD, we'll do that. I think this patient's got asthma, we'll order a different set of testing for you. And we'll make it very clear in the report. And if I get something very strongly positive, unusual, I'll pick up the phone and give you a call and let you know as well. Fantastic. Um, I've got some um, specific um, medical questions here. And I just a, a message came through from our organisers basically saying any GPs who would like can actually leave the webinar now, but we may as well go on and, and we've got a little bit more time to cover some of these questions. Um, this is quite a, a specific one 
about, so just pick it up again. Azithromycin, do you mind answering that, this question? Azithromycin in COPD patients, Charles? 250 yes. milligrams, three days a week. I have a few patients come back on this regime. How long are we there to keep them on it? It's from one of the GPs. I do it for, I do it for lifelong or as long as I think it's working. Um, the studies based on um, a NEGM study that was done about eight years ago that showed that um, the addition of zithromycin reduces exacerbation frequency. Um, yep. This was done in before we had the new triple therapy and there's been no open comparison. So I just leave them on it if I think it's working. If I don't think it's working, I, I take them off it. Azithromycin because of the macrolides because they're core in the treatment of mycobacterium avium complex infections or mm. all the other non-mycobacterial tuberculosis infections, I will test for that. And then I'll also check for QT promulgation as well um, on an initial ECG. And then I usually write to whichever GP I'm is referred and said, could you please repeat an ECG and check the QT is not prolonging. But yeah, lifelong. Yeah. And uh, this is a question for Ellen. Does Ellen have any thoughts about exertional oxygen in the rehab setting? Despite evidence showing little benefit, what is her clinical experience in practice? Um, so no, in the rehab setting, we don't just use oxygen therapy therapy um, for the exertional purposes. It's only as Chuck was discussing before, those patients who do desaturate, you know, on their six minute walk test um, that we think, you know, will benefit from oxygen therapy to improve their outcomes and their exercise tolerance throughout the program, particularly those clients who I was saying before are more in the seated program. Um, so they definitely are severely deconditioned. They're experiencing, you know, lots of shortness of breath on exertion so that we can then, you know, gain increases in, in their muscle mass and their overall exercise tolerance to help improve their fatigue. Um, we're also looking at a lot of fact, other factors as well. So breathlessness management wise, maybe it's the use of an aid to so something like a four wheelie walker to help exercise tolerance, their pacing strategies, um, rather than just that oxygen therapy delivery as such. Yep. I hope that's awesome. Thank you. And um, just a question about if um, a patient has completed the program, and they feel they would benefit from doing it again, are they able to do that? We do get a lot of re-referrals. Um, yeah. So that is through the clinician's discretion. We do have you know, a few clients who we call our long-termers who aren't discharged from the program because we know if they are discharged, they're at a higher risk of exacerbations of the airway disease. Um, we know yeah. that they'll stop continuing with their exercise programs on discharge. So we feel they actually benefit from coming once a week or twice a week just to continue, um, you know, advocating for, for their care. Um, but look, sometimes we have clients who might just come in for a little bit of a winter fit strategy. They'll come in for a bit of maintenance work um, yep. and yeah, they'll be discharged again from the program. So the whole idea is we're educating these patients on how to exercise and then how to manage their own airway disease. But sometimes they do need a little bit of maintenance again. Yeah, got it. And there's a question um, that's been set in. What about the combination of llama and lava? And I think, Charles, you said one of the take-home messages I picked up was Llamas are our, our go-to drug for COPD. So this yeah, was so about the, the combination of llama and lava. The only advantage is a reduction in, in dyspnea with the addition of the lava. Got That's it. the main role. So that people are less breathless and they can do more with it. It's just a long-acting ventolin. So rather than taking ventolin every four hours, they can they can take it yeah. once a day. Yep. Yeah. And I, you know what? I I think we've probably probably covered everything. We've got quite a few people who've just called, written in and said thank you to the three of you for this presentation. So, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we've really very much appreciated your um, presentation tonight. And it's funny how you can just sort of get on a roll at the end with these questions. There's been a lot of interest. 
And uh, I just wanted to remind the participants to fill in their evaluations. And thanks again to you, Charles, Maria and Ellen. Thanks from all of us. Thank and you. I think that's all. I'm signing off now. Bye. Bye.